Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Vector War Spotlight 2019 Resolutions. Resolve to reduce effort and deliver more value to your clients in 2019. Learn tips and tricks to organize and automate geometry and attributes of your event models using Vectorworks Spotlight 2019. This webinar in particular will focus on some powerful uses of the resource manager, symbols, and object attributes to reduce time and effort required to present in 3D model client proposals. Today's webinar presenter, Jacob Dale, has spent the past two decades applying his passions to entertainment and architecture while obsessing over workflow efficiencies. He has earned a Master's of Architecture and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Technical Design for the stage. Jacob works with his team at Tangibly to empower virtually all the behind the scenes entertainment professionals and their teams that create the impossible every day. Established in 2015, Tangibly.com is recognized as a top team training resource for entertainment companies who desire to keep their, their teams skilled on the cutting edge of design and planning workflows. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Noveg. Noveg is a one of the largest online store for design software. We offer a huge assortment of design solutions and uh, including all the Vectorworks product line and Tangibly, who recently became our partners of, and we offer their training um, products. So check them both out at Noveg.com. And I want to remind you that you can find all the latest news on promotions and new releases on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and last but not least, I want to remind you that today's webinar is free and is also being recorded and you can watch it again on Vimeo and YouTube. And now, seriously, all lights on Jacob. Take it away, Jacob. Okay, now I'm going to show my screen so you actually be able to see my face if I still got this up here. Here yeah. we are. So hello world. I always get so nervous about these things. And I and I was talking to Barbara about that before we started recording. And we do this every day. I'm in the studio every day. I'm in front of a camera every day and I meet with folks. And I think what makes me nervous about the, the webinars is first the volume of people. So how many we have on the call today, Barbara? You think you said over 100? Over 100 registered, so. That's amazing. So I'm really excited uh, that y'all took some time out of your day uh, to meet with me and you're just gambling that I might actually have something of value to show you. So thanks for taking that gamble with your time. Um, but happy new year. Um, and the thing that will make me less nervous about this process is if y'all interact a little bit. Uh, so if you send any questions or comments to Barbara, I welcome her to uh, share those with me as we go. I much prefer that kind of, uh, feedback as we go or at uh, certain intervals rather than waiting all the way to the end because um, normally when we have these meetings, we do Q&A Wednesdays with our clients when they're enrolled in some of our training programs like the one that Barbara showed. Thanks for sharing that, Barbara. Uh, but when we have Q&A Wednesday, it's a very interactive approach. I get to see your face up there. If you choose to share it, I can hear your voice. Um, and there might be a whole group of us on different teams. We're talking interactively about the challenges that we have with VectorWorks Spotlight. I love that process. It's it's almost as dynamic as being in person. You can't uh, ever compete with that in person interaction. We understand that, but we're really trying to come really close with it with the format that we use. So happy 2019. What a year it is already becoming. I'm like a real big tech nerd. I follow a lot of the tech news. One of my favorite uh, uh, groups to follow is Tesla. Oh, man, Elon Musk, you're changing the world. You're doing it, man. These are the things that I get excited about. These are the teams I root for. Uh, tech is my sport, as I often tell my clients. Um, Tesla is now the uh, now a major car manufacturer as of the the production numbers. Why am I talking about that? Because that is the future, man. This is like now we've got the big four. It's no longer the big three automakers. That actually, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it because I remember back many years ago just hearing about the concept of electric cars and just really rooting for it. 
And um, here we are in the future now. This is the sci-fi future fantasy that we used to watch in movies. Now we're living in it. Because you're meeting with us around the world in high definition video, high definition audio. We get to have these meetings. That's really cool. But uh, just one more thing I read about last night before I finally fell asleep. Hyundai announced at CES they have a car that walks on four legs. That's what they just developed. So this is just like mind blowing, but then it makes you realize, man, we really are living in this future where we can truly create anything that we put our mind to. Um, so that's why, you know, there in the intro, Barbara was describing that we help uh, folks make the impossible become possible every day. Um, it's really exciting. I'm honored to be sitting right here on your computer screen to do that. And I will put away this video in just a moment and we're gonna go into Vectorworks Spotlight because I know that's actually why you're here, not really just to see me talk. Um, but thank you for giving me a moment to say hello. And today I actually want to talk, before I turn off this camera, I wanna talk about something um, that actually gets me pretty excited about Vectorworks. Uh, in general, but specifically Spotlight, is um, the ability to go from a two-dimensional workflow, which is effectively drawing lines on paper, right? And then going and making a 3D object. So this is always on my desk just to remind me of the future, but we can actually model 3D objects. Now, we're not gonna attempt something this uh, challenging in Vectorworks today, uh, even though it is possible, um, I'm not going to try to do that on a live demo because, uh, you know, there will be pitfalls and I don't think we could do that in 45 minutes approximately. So what we're going to do is something a little bit more simple or maybe not so simple. So um, around the holidays, there's usually like light festivals and that kind of thing. And I just was looking at some of the local goings on recently and I saw this image and it's this image of this serpent or dragon at this um, light festival. And I was thinking, you know, that is actually possible in Vectorworks and you know, it might be kind of neat to build one of these if you are a lighting designer, event designer, experiential designer. Um, you know, if you're involved in the event space, live events, you might have encountered these type of festivals from one of your clients. But also the, uh, the thing is you could propose these type of things. If you could model it in 3D with Vectorworks Spotlight, then you can use your skills of understanding lighting and color theory and you know event planning to illuminate this object. So what is that hurdle that we can get over to get you to that point? And I think that starts with the 3D modeling aspect. This looks like a really challenging object. It is challenging, I gotta admit, I've gone through this practice a few times and definitely with a few stumbles, that is part of pushing the envelope, right? We always run into these roadblocks and that is the value of the training that we offer is that uh, we give you the opportunity to put comments into lectures in some of our training programs um, so we can help you uh, usually within the you know 24 hour time span or much less sometimes within the hour we will respond directly to your comments on those workflows and then uh, you know sometimes even post a fresh video that actually clarifies the challenge that you might be having because this software spotlight is so robust, there's always a hurdle you're gonna run into. Um, so it helps to have a team there to help you. So this is that team tangibly, and we're here to support you there. So enough about that, let's actually get into the hard stuff. Let's actually challenge ourselves to go from a 2D plane to a 3D plane. So just one more time, this image, uh, what are we looking at here is actually repetitive objects. No, we're not gonna try to model that dragon head today. I know that would be an awesome challenge. Maybe the next webinar, Barbara, take note on that. Um, but today we're just going to create the undulating kind of arch structure of that dragon. And we're going to try to do it in as few steps as possible, make it as simple as possible and efficiently. That's really the key of what we're after here, right? Um, in design, if you take uh, a project and you do it in less steps, that gives you more time to pursue new contracts, uh, you know, to go check your social feeds or go spend time with your family and friends or maybe go out for a beer with your team. So let's try to save you a few steps in this workflow and uh, feel free, like I said, drop in those comments as we go. And then at a, you know, at any time during this workflow, Barbara, if you see a good opportunity to jump in and drop in some comments, please do. So I'm going to close this 
video right here, and then we're going to go to Vectorworks Spotlight. So just to prove to you that it is possible in Vectorworks, I'm kind of, this is like a baking show, uh, so to speak, where, you know, they just pull it out of the oven and everything's done, you know, uh, before they even start mixing all the ingredients, like here it is. Well, this isn't fully baked, so we'll call this an 80% maybe, but this is the body of the serpent that we are pursuing. So we want to go for something very similar to this. And one thing that uh, Barbara was mentioning is, uh, you know, Novedge does sell software. Um, they, yeah, I'm really excited that they've teamed up with us uh, to offer um, our training products now, which is really awesome. So they're becoming this one-stop shop uh, for design tools, both software but and, and training, but also hardware as well. And so uh, one thing that they do offer as far as hardware goes that we rely on them for is we buy a lot of those 3D connection space mouses or state space mice i should say that correctly um the 3d connection uh 3d space mouse is really cool when you get into that third dimension when you want to start doing things like rotating around your objects and panning in really uh smooth and uh doing you know that's a nice little flashy demo of what is possible with a 3d connection space mouse and combining that with Vectorwork Spotlight. So if you are going into the third dimension and you wanna do some client presentations, uh, you might wanna pick up some hardware from Novedge uh, 3D Connection Space Mouse. Lots of fun, uh, but that's not why we're here. I'm gonna actually start with a clean slate because um, you see here it's all done. What's the fun? Let's actually get started and try to break some things. So I'm just gonna start a new file here just to show you that it's all possible from a completely blank document to get to this form factor. And we're gonna to try to do that in the remaining 30 to 40 minutes we've got left in this webinar. So a big task, but let's go for it. We're gonna create a blank document. In case you're wondering, I am using Vectorworks Spotlight 2019. So I'll go up into the Vectorworks uh, folder or to the, the header here, Vectorworks, and we could say about Vectorworks, and we see there that we're on 2019. So within 2019, a special note, for those of you folks that have been using Vectorworks for quite a few years, you might not be aware of this, but I'm just gonna peek into this real quick, and I'm gonna look at my design layer. And we notice here that the scale is already set to one to 48. That's a quarter inch scale set to my design layer. If you're used to using Vectorworks from past versions, it's always defaulted at a one-to-one -one scale when you open a new file. So just to keep, your, uh, to keep that note uh, top of mind when you are creating new projects, um, that will or those projects will already be at scale. So starting with a blank document, uh, I wanna make sure that I toggle on my page boundary so I get this little page center here and take note of the snaps that I have uh, here that I'm using. Uh, I don't usually use grid snaps, but everything else, uh, all my snaps are turned on except for grid snap. But what's really important is the snap to object. So snap to object means that I can snap to the page center there. But uh, one thing that I learned from uh, my architecture uh, instructor in high school has stuck with me 20 years now and that is everything fits into a box and so if you're going to create anything usually a good place to start is with the container that that object is going to go into yes i know not a physical container in the world but the box that you can start to draw from so what i like to do usually is just start with the rectangle and create the parameters or the constraints of the object that we want to create so rectangle tool is a good way to start. If you double click on the rectangle tool, you get this nice uh, menu here. We can actually just enter the information for that rectangle. So what am I creating the rectangle for right now? That is the opening of the archway, so to speak. So on that serpent, if you remember back to that image, we want to create the clear space or the opening that visitors to this event can actually walk through and around this particular sculpture. So we're creating the opening there. So we can establish that the opening should be approximately 10 feet, and this is designed, so we're just starting uh, with some broad strokes here. So 10 feet wide, and we'll say that the um, archway needs to be approximately eight feet tall. So we want it tall enough that people can walk underneath, but they're not necessarily gonna jump up and hang on it, right? So we wanna make that eight feet tall. Um, so we're putting that width and height of the rectangle in there. And then the next panel that's just below width and height is actually, um, I call it your pen board. And so you can select the bottom center of your pen board. Now there's a little bit of a, a space issue here. So if I expand that a little bit, we'll see that our pen board, this is your insertion point. Uh, so when you create that new rectangle and you say, okay, 
Uh, position at next click should be checked as well, but you want that little insertion point there. You say okay, and you notice how the rectangle kind of hovers around my cursor at the bottom center. We wanna click on the page center here, and uh, we are there just in two dimensions. So that actually makes me think, okay, I forgot a step there. So this happens pretty uh, often in a typical daily workflow. We take two steps forward and sometimes we gotta take one step back. So I created that rectangle, but I'm in a 2D plane. I actually wanna create that in a 3D plane. So I'm gonna be looking at the front of that archway, not at the ground plan. So I'm gonna back up one. I'm just gonna do Command Z there and uh, the rectangle goes away. And I want to change my view, not from top plan, but to front. So I'm going to go to front, and we'll see that my uh, workspace has changed a little bit. The grid goes away because we're no longer in a two-dimensional work, working plane, and we actually go to a three-dimensional view. And we know this because my 3D axes are showing up here. The red and the blue is your X, Y axes, and the green is actually adding that Z axis. So we have height now to our width. And we are going to place the rectangle within this view so that the rectangle stands upright. We also want to confirm that we're in an orthogonal view. So when we establish that rectangle, we're actually looking at it without perspective applied. It's just going to be flat on the front there. So again, double click on your rectangle tool. And the cool thing is it actually remembers all the settings that we had in our rectangle tool the last time we used the tool. So we don't have to redo that step. So even though we took one step back, it's technically like a half step back, right? So then we wanna place that rectangle on the page center. So we're now in a 3D view and we know that because we can, again, using the space mouse, we can rotate around and we see that rectangle that we're using as a, um, as a guide. Okay, so as we rotate around, oh, okay. So this always happens in Vectorworks if you just open a blank file, is we haven't actually saved the file yet and Vectorworks says, we want to save you time, this is really important, is backing up your file as you work. That's actually one of the most important things you can do to save time in 2019, is setting up a backup system. Vectorworks has that all set up for you. You actually just have to say yes here. That'll remind you, you actually have to save the file. So I want to go and save the file, and I don't want to do it on Vectorworks backup. I actually want to do it on desktop. I know we don't normally save our projects to desktop, but it's just easier so you don't have to see my mess of file organization here. So I'm gonna create a new folder, even though, yep, I've got one that's called Dragon Proposal there. Uh, let's just say that that's some old work. And, you know, I did show you that we had a baking show here. Something was already baked. So uh, we're gonna say proposal. I always type a lot slower in a live demo for some reason, just because I'm trying not to do the typos. And then Dragon Proposal again. Or we can just call that dragon dash one just to save a little time. So we're saving this file into a project folder. And the reason why we're doing that, we basically created a project folder so that when Vectorworks creates a Vectorworks backup folder, it's actually placed inside that project for you automatically. So we're going to save that. And then real quick, I'm going to go to my desktop and we're going to open that dragon proposal to folder. And we're going to see in there, there's that Vectorworks backup folder. Vectorworks did that automatically for you. So that's why you want to put it in a project folder and not just drop your project files on your desktop because then you end up with another Vectorworks backup folder on your desktop. And then if you ever move this project elsewhere, well, then you got these random Vectorworks backup folders just kind of cluttering up your space. So we combine a lot of steps in there. So if there's any questions related to that, have I lost anybody thus far? Happy to take a minute and just take a step back. But otherwise, we'll just continue on because we've got a little bit of ground to cover. All right, so here we are in 3D. Again, I use that 3D connection mouse to spin around. I can even zoom in and zoom out. But we're seeing this kind of faint gray outline here. Uh, I just want to get rid of that. That's actually my page boundary. I'll toggle that off. And then I can Command-6. I'll just zoom extents to that object. And then now that we're using this as a template, this is just basically a guide. Uh, we want to go back to our front view. And what we want to do is establish the shape to the outside of this. So this is our clear uh, space that we need for people to walk through. So it's an archway, so to speak. I know it's rectilinear, but imagine an arch in there and we'll get there eventually. Um, what we want to do is draw basically the L shape or the, um, the side of this object um, down to the midpoint. 
because what we're going to do is take that um, kind of right angle and then uh, duplicate it to create that undulating um, structure of the serpent. So just to take that little corner or that, that angle there, I can actually grab my polygon tool and polygon tool shortcut eight on your keyboard. We're gonna click from the midpoint of that rectangle, the top right corner, and then the midpoint on the right hand side there. Double click to end the polygon. And you'll see in the object info palette on your upper right hand corner, we've got a polygon. So pretty simple. We've got this polygon, it's not closed, it's actually open, which means we've got two sides, but there's not a third side. What we're gonna do is take that object now and offset it to create the diameter of the serpent's body. So we wanna look for the offset tool, that is in our basic tool palette. Go to the offset tool, it's also shift minus on your keyboard shortcuts for Mac. And I th think it may be the same on PC, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we want to make sure that our modes are correct on the offset tool and you'll find those modes up here in the mode bar the first mode offset by distance is what we want and then the second mode here is duplicate and offset so we actually want to duplicate the original object but there's one more that we want to set and that's in the offset uh, tool preferences and that is close open curves close open curves means that it's going to close that polygon once it offsets that other uh, shape so we'll close open curves, and then we want to make sure that our distance, our offset distance is actually two feet. So that establishes the diameter of the body of the serpent. Okay, and now the next click, you notice our cursor is a little bit different. It's actually like a plus um, uh, cursor now. That just is showing us like if we have a different action right now. And if we click to the outside of the shape, we get our closed uh, our closed curve, so to speak, but basically it's combining the polygon into this closed polygon shape. This polygon shape is going to define the, the body of our serpent. So now is when we actually take the method of never drawing the same thing twice in Vectorworks. This is something that one of my um, early mentors in design firm, uh, actually when I worked in an architecture firm many years ago, uh, the, the principal said, never draw the same thing twice uh, in Vectorworks, and I was really baffled by that because we were drawing a lot of houses at the time, and you know, you draw a lot of windows and a lot of doors, and I just felt like I was using the same thing all the time. And really, what he was saying is, um, you want to make it a symbol if you're going to create the same object because you have the ability to duplicate that symbol as many times as you want. You don't have to redraw the source uh, shape. So we have created this polygon. We can confirm in the object info palette that we just have that one polygon selected. The next thing we can do is go to modify and create symbol. We create the symbol and actually just, uh, this is still going to be a uh, template at this moment. So I'm just gonna call that template dash one. You'll see uh, the method to my madness in just a little bit. So next mouse click is where we want our insertion point to go. And we also wanna make sure that uh, other options, uh, leave instance in place is actually checked because when you put symbols into the resource manager, if you don't have this little box checked here, leave instance in place, then the object will actually leave your drawing area and it will just get filed away into your resource manager. So you wanna make sure that stays in your drawing area. Say okay. Next click is gonna be our insertion point. I'm just gonna place that at a midpoint that um, we might insert uh, you know, something predictable. So if we're gonna be joining these different segments together, I'm gonna to put that at a midpoint. So put that at a midpoint, say okay. Now, why did I do this? Uh, the reason is that I might have to reshape this repeating element. We're basically creating a module, a module for this uh, serpent so that these objects can repeat and we create that serpentine uh, kind of feel. So we have this symbol. What we wanna do now is mirror this um, so that we can see that repeating element. So with the object selected, we see the 2D symbol is selected in our object info palette. We wanna go to our mirror tool that's in our that's in our basic tool palette. We can also use the equals key on our keyboard. I wanna make sure that the mode of the mirror tool is actually set to duplicate mode, not standard mode. Standard mode would actually just flip the object and we don't keep the original. We wanna duplicate it. So we're on duplicate. The next thing we wanna do is mirror along the edges. Um, so we're gonna mirror one object uh, this way, and then we're basically going to go in both directions that the serpent would go. So I'm going to select that same object again and mirror the other direction. 
And some of y'all might be screaming at me right now, oh, the serpent's gonna go in circles now, but that's okay. We actually can flip this using the mirror tool as well. So this object here that we mirrored over, we can flip that uh, using the mirror tool, but you wanna toggle back to the first mode on the mirror tool, so the standard mode. And we're gonna flip this along that midpoint axis. So we flipped that. Okay, so the next problem that we recognize is our ground plane that we've established, given that we use the insertion point here. We're pretending that this axis down here is our ground plane. We notice that that object is actually a little bit tall for the repetitive nature that we've set up. But that's why we used symbols for this template. So I'll show you why. I'm gonna hit the X on the keyboard to go back to the selection tool, grab the lower left corner of that object and bring it up to where it snaps to that X. And then now we see that these objects are overlapping. And when we edit symbols, remember that you wanna edit the original symbol, not a mirrored symbol. Because, well, if I double click on the symbol and go to 2D components, I'm editing it, I look for the symbol in that space, I'm gonna hit Command-6 to zoom extents there to the object, and I see no repeating elements. That is because that was the mirrored symbol. And there used to be a little uh, uh, notice that lets you know you're editing a mirrored symbol instance. Uh, I don't see that now in 2019, but I can't say why. It might have been because I just dis dismissed that disclaimer. Um, but if we go to the original symbol that we created, double click there, edit the 2D components, and Command-6 zoom extents, we see, well, we should actually see a reference there. I'm wondering why we're not seeing that. Interesting. All right, so live demos, that's what happens. Um, but what we're trying to do is edit this symbol so that it uh, doesn't overlap. We want it to just meet on the end uh, just perfectly. Um, so one thing that we can do is just basically measure this distance between these two points cut that in half, and that's basically uh, how much we wanna shorten that object. So what is that? I usually use the line tool to measure. It's just quick and easy for me in Vectorworks. And if we use the line tool between those two points, it's two feet. Uh, we see that right there in the data display bar, uh, two feet. And we can grab that information uh, to our clipboard if we need to, but in this circumstance, we don't. So I'm just gonna exit out of there. I don't wanna draw the line. I actually was just measuring with it. So I wanna shorten that little length by one foot. So I'm going to edit the 2D component. I'm going to find that object. And I just want to take one foot off of this object. So if I edit this particular object, I can double click and move this up one foot. So if you notice the data display bar, when I when I selected that control point in the, in the middle center there, um, we, we have a length that is starting to calculate real time. I can zoom in a little bit. I don't know if y'all are seeing the zoom or not, um, but the uh, the distance is being calculated. We can actually just tab over and say negative one foot, hit return. Oh, that's going the wrong direction. So I'm gonna escape out of that. Again, select that and actually wanna do positive one foot. I should have noticed that there's actually not a negative there, so I should follow that same uh, procedure and just say one foot. If we hit enter once, it's basically creating a fence, so it's limiting that object to that one foot, and then if we click at that point, we've edited the symbol, exit the symbol, and now they touch just perfectly. So we're respecting our ground plane, we have our clearance for our eight feet here, eight feet tall, 10 feet wide, and these are the basic components of our serpent. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment, take a sip of water. If there are any questions here, please feel free to shoot them off. We have yet to receive questions. So that is amazing. It is. I'm so <laughs> We're captivated. We're captivated. Okay, so I hope to not disappoint in the next step because it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, but that's part of the fun of it, right? That's why y'all watch these live webinars is because you're trying to see what might break in the meantime, right? So here we are, let's get started on going to 3D. So once again, I can rotate in 3D with my space mouse and I see, you know, these are just lines right now. We want a 3D object. Okay, we're gonna create that serpent. So I'm gonna go back to front view. And what I wanna do now is um, I actually can get, I deleted that one rectangle I was using as the template in the middle and I'm gonna delete this polygon too. 
Um, so all we're left with are the basic elements, the basic building blocks of what we're after right now. And we are going to take this object here, and we used assemble so that we could flip these along mirrored axes. And then if, as we edited, we were confirming that the geometry matched up properly. So we'll see that you know we the midpoints uh, match up properly. But what we need to do is actually take this template and turn it back into a group because there's a problem with creating 2D and 3D hybrid symbols that we're not gonna get into at this moment. But basically all we're looking to do, create right now is a 3D symbol. And part of that reason is because we're looking at it in a front view and hybrid symbols would basically define this shape as a screen plane object or would put it in the 2D plane. So I don't wanna to confuse too much, but basically just following along, we wanna take this symbol and modify and ungroup it or convert to uh, convert to a polygon. So I think the quickest way to just do that is Command or Control U. Is that right? Uh, no, that didn't do it. So modify and let's see, convert to group. I think is what we want to do. Uh, so yeah, convert to group. So Command K would be convert to group. Um, in some circumstances, you can ungroup higher level objects in Vectorworks. So that's why I got off on that tangent there. But I converted it to a group, so basically that just turns it back into a polygon. So it takes the symbol, grabs that information out of the symbol, but if I open my resource manager, so command R, resource manager, and I go to my, let's see, I'm in Dragon 1 is my file, open files, and I'm going to look at all resources, not textures, but all resources, my template's still there. So I didn't lose it. That's kind of the value of creating symbols too. You can always go back and grab that template if you need it. So I'm gonna close this resource manager and grab this object, which is now a polygon, which you see in the object info palette. And now I wanna convert this into an extrude. So this is gonna give us the 3D information that we're looking to define as the diameter or the body of that uh, serpent. So this diameter is two feet wide because we defined it that way using the offset tool. Uh, but I wanna extrude this object and we can actually move into a 3D view to do that. Kind of a cool feature of having this 3D orbit mouse here. Uh, we got that object selected and Command E or Control E in Windows, but Command E on the Mac here. And I wanna extrude it by, it looks like a negative direction of one foot and say, okay. And you'll see here that we're defining some volume uh, for that uh, for that object. We can rotate around in 3D. We're getting a little bit of a graphic error here. It's kind of interesting. Um, so we'll go back and just change the view, top plan and front. And let's see about an isometric, see if that refreshes the graphics there. Okay, so negative, positive direction. I could have gone um, in the positive direction as well. I've just seen it kind of inverted there. But trick of the eye, we still got the object that we wanted. You might be saying, okay, well, you only extruded at one feet. The diameter of that uh, body that we're defining is actually two feet. So why did we do that? Well, we're actually applying what is referred to as bilateral symmetry here. And this is, uh, you know, you see this in nature. All of us have bilateral symmetry. If you were to uh, strike a plane like the z-axis down the middle of our body, hopefully one side of the body looks very much like the left, right? Uh, in all best case circumstances. So we have this half of an object. What we want to create is the other half of that object. We'll get to that step. But first, I want to make a symbol out of this. Um, Jacob, before you yes. go to the second half of the object, um, we were wondering what space mouse you are using, asking for oh, a friend. Okay, okay, asking for a friend. Asking from John, one of our attendees. Oh, great. Thanks, John, for the question. Um, let's see. I'm going to turn on my video here. Can you all see me? Yes. Awesome. All right. What I'm using is the Space Mouse Wireless. So Space Mouse Wireless um, from 3D Connection. Why did I choose this one? It's just compact. I do a lot of traveling for training too. So um, I can drop this in a little case and put it in my bag. Um, and it's also wireless because I try to keep as many cables off my desk as I can. But when I'm on the plane, this actually sits just right on my laptop. Um, and it's got a little bit of weight to it, but it's worth carrying around. 
So yeah, 3D connection, space mouse, wireless. And That's coincidentally, we also sell it at Novage. By the hey, way, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, um, can you play computer games with it? Um, <laughs> The, the computer game that I play the most is called Vectorworks Spotlight. The best. <laughs> I actually, yeah, I don't get into games that much. I wish I could, could make some time for it, but I geek out on this stuff all day. So um, good question, though. Thanks. Um, you can use it for a whole load of programs. I know there's a lot of settings in there for a bunch of different software. You can even use it for video editing, sound editing, um, especially 3D modeling. That's really what I like using it for. Um, so really great tool to use. I, uh, I I feel like I couldn't do a 3D workflow without it now. I mean, obviously, there are shortcuts in Vectorworks that you can use, uh, but it's just much more intuitive. So we've created this half of the object that we want to uh, that we want to define our serpent with. But we want to go back to our front view and we want to make this object a symbol again. So we basically took the template converted it to a group so that we could take the polygon, extrude it, and now we're going to make it a symbol. Because if we'd used 2D information, it would have created a hybrid symbol. So we're just trying to avoid that mist up there. So we get the object selected, go to modify, and create symbol like we did last time. But before I do that, I actually want to rotate to a 3D view really quick. You're going to see why. So 3D view, go to the left here. Uh, we're not seeing through this object. That's why I got kind of confused. Uh, we have some opacity to the object, but that depth is actually there. But what we're looking for is this insertion point. Remember when we created the template object, we had that insertion point. When we create our symbol, our 3D symbol, I want to make that insertion point, insertion point for that 3D symbol. So I rotated to a 3D view so I can drop the insertion point at that point. So again, going back to modify, create symbol, we're going to... Um, I'm just going to call this real quick, uh, body one, and then next mouse click, leave instance in place, say OK, and then there we are. We get the opportunity to insert our insertion point. I'm clicking at that point. And then the next thing is it's just asking you how you want to organize your symbols in your project. We're not going to worry too much about organization here at that level because we don't have a lot of symbols at this point. Um, but we've created that symbol just to prove it to you here in the resource manager now we have body one and template and you'll see that that is a 3d object and we'll close the resource manager and go back to our world here now why did i do that because i wanted to create the symbol because i'm about to use some subdivision modeling techniques on this 3d object um, so that we get kind of a nice organic shape to it. Um, it also allows us to model in three dimensions a lot easier. But we have to repeat this object to get that true sense of what we're up to. So first, before I add the bilateral symmetry and, uh, and, and turn this into a subdivision model, I want to actually go back to my front view. And we're going to delete um, this uh, template here. We're going to delete this template here because now we can just mirror this particular object that we created. And remember in your mirror tool, I have the object selected. In a mirror tool, go to the duplicate mode and we're gonna just mirror it along this axis. And again, yeah, I know I gotta flip that, uh, but we could also use the rotate tool. That's another way to get there. And then mirror tool, we're gonna mirror it this way. And I can just mirror this as well. Again, using the equal key on your keyboard. Uh-oh, we duplicated it instead. That's all right. Delete the other one. Command 6. All right. Uh, that zooms extents. We're going to select this object and mirror that to the other side. So a lot of mirroring going on here, but just to show you that repetitive object there. And I'm going to do that mirror a couple more times just to uh, show a nice long serpent that we're after here. So mirror there. Now, I'm, I'm making sure that I actually click on the endpoint of those objects. If you're kind of haphazard or if you have your grid snap on and you're not quite getting objects meeting up, it's probably because your grid snaps are throwing you off. It's snapping to the grid instead of snapping to the object. So just a little disclaimer there uh, for accuracy's sake. And we're going to grab that other object. We mirror it out there and move it to the other side of the object. So uh, this is kind of like that game Snake. If you ever had an old Nokia uh, phone, I said I was a tech geek. But yeah, one of the first video games I ever played was the Snake game on uh, the Nokia phone. This looks a lot like that Snake. But we're going to give it some three dimensions and give a little bit more organic smoothness.
But if I rotate into 3D, we see we got half of that object. We're going to go for the other half now. So how do we do that? We're going to go back to the symbol. Rather than messing with this whole object here, go back to a regular isometric view. We're kind of under the grid there. That does happen with the space mouse every now and then. So we're looking at this object. We want to edit the object and turn it into a uh, subdivision object and then uh, create bilateral symmetry with it. But we want to do that through the symbol because that provides uh, the opportunity to do less work. And we're all, always after that pursuit here. So I'm going to go back to this original symbol, edit the 3D component. And this is the extrude. We want to convert that extrude, modify, and convert the actually model and create sub node that's convert. There we go. I'm always getting confused between the modify and model menu because there's so many options in here to do 3D modeling. Uh, so if we go to convert and we want to convert this to a subdivision, so I have the object selected, modify, convert, convert to subdivision. Now, the subdivision iteration is kind of an interesting concept. This is basically the quote unquote resolution or polygons of this subdivision object. So if I were to set this at a higher number, it's basically a smoothing angle, right? So the more polygons you have on a 3D object, the smoother it can be. But we want to drop this down to zero at this moment. We could go higher, but that I think it's just going to confuse the message at the moment. So we're going to leave it at zero, which means that the subdivision object is going to look just like what we have. It's going to look rectilinear in our drawing area. So we'll say, OK, it is now a subdivision object. We'll look here in the object info palette. It says subdivision. And it's at an iteration of zero. So just to show you what an iteration um, higher than zero would look like. We can actually do this on the fly with subdivision objects. Keep in mind, you're still in the symbol edit. And we're going to edit the subdivision object, which exists within that symbol. And we want to go down to iteration. We're just going to change that to one. Look at that. So we get that repetition throughout the model. We see what that subdivision looks like. Obviously, the, the links aren't coming together. And that's why we're leaving it at an iteration of zero for the moment before we create our bilateral symmetry and connect those ends. Go back to iteration zero, get that kind of blocky effect. We want to stay within the symbol. The next thing we want to do is actually edit this subdivision object. And the way that you can do that is by uh, double clicking on the object, and you get the subdivision edit mode. So the, any subdivision object, if you double click it, you get all these modes up here at the top to edit subdivisions. Now, we've done a couple of webinars in the past about subdivision modeling. If you want to go back to that uh, and kind of learn step by step how subdivision modeling works. And I anticipate when we talk about modeling the dragon head on the next uh, webinar that we schedule, uh, we'll be doing a lot more of the subdivision modeling. One of my favorite tools in, in Spotlight because it really just kind of uh, blows the doors off of the 3D modeling uh, capabilities uh, here on the computer. Uh, but what I'm really looking toward in this uh, new subdivision uh, feature is the uh, mirror modeling mode. So this is where we create that bilateral symmetry of the object. I'm going to escape out of this, um, this subdivision editing mode just by, let's see, I'm not escaping well. Um, what I'm really trying to do is go to the other side of the object. So I'm going by the, this, the insertion point. I want that to be the center of the object. And I want to put it to the other side. And I have to be on the, on the face that I'm wanting to uh, duplicate, <clears throat> excuse me, duplicate from. Because with the, this object selected, which is the subdivision, and then we select mirror modeling mode, everything else grays out. And the sub subdivision tool is actually asking us to select the face that we want to mirror across. So we select the face first, but then we actually have to select the points on that face to model across. And those points are these two top points here. So we're going to snap to that point, and we're going to snap to the other point. And you see it's already trying to mirror. You can actually mirror on, a, on an angle if you want to, but right now we're just looking for that bilateral symmetry. Make sure you're snapping to that other object uh, or to that point there on the center line. A little bit tricky to do in 3D, but we got it. And uh, now we can exit that symbol.
Now all of those links, all those pieces are linked up. It's all modular. And now what we can do is actually give this that organic shape that we're looking for. So we've got that repetitive symbol. We want to edit that symbol now. So select that symbol, double click, go back to the 3D component. And now that we have established bilateral symmetry with the subdivision tool, we only have to edit half of it. So we're actually cutting our work in half and we're not having to go and tweak both sides to make sure they look just the same. So all of these segments are all repetitions of half of this object that you see right here. So let's change this iteration and give it a little bit of an organic shape. So we're gonna go to two, maybe that's a little bit drastic. We're gonna go to one, we keep it basic here. And then the next thing we wanna do is actually edit this object so that the faces match. So maybe if I back that up, let's, uh, let's double click here and see if that's the right way to go. Um, when you double click in the, uh, into the subdivision object, you're gonna get a cage around it that actually manipulates that subdivision object. And that is back to the iteration of zero. So you can change this iteration on the fly, even at, in this edit mode, you can change that to a much more organic shape. And we can still select the faces of that cage. The cage controls all of the subdivision object inside. So you'll see that now that's selected, we've gotten these modes for the subdivision modeling. And what we're looking for is to crease, quote unquote, crease this face. And so I'm actually already on that mode, uh, but we're gonna go to crease mode and you can do this on edges. But what I would suggest here is you crease that face. And what you see here in that repetitive uh, symbol definition is that that makes sure that both of those faces come together because they're mirrored right along that line. And we wanna do the same to this face down here. Well, the challenge is in sub D modeling, you can't quite get to that face if you have other faces in, in the way. Well, we could go and rotate and then come back and everything uh, with our normal tools, but uh, such is a circumstance where you might actually use your 3D space mouse. So if you could elegantly just rotate down there and then now you can select that face and match those up. We exit the symbol and we back up a little bit and we see that kind of serpentine shape uh, that we started the baking show with. Lovely. Jacob, I have a question. Uh, sure. What would have happened if you extruded along the path when you removed symbol and made a group? Um, so we can, we can still extrude along path. Um, and that is a different way to create this kind of serpentine shape. Um, but the challenge there is editing um, the object in more than just that one, uh, that one path. So like when we have a symbol or a, a subdivision object definition, if we go edit this particular object, we can edit it in more than just that original shape. So an extrude along path would be, let's say for example, we take a circle and a line or a uh, spline. It could be um, along a varied path, right? But that circle would be extruded as like a pipe or a tube, but then to go redefine that, uh, the definition of that extrude, it would redefine the whole, the, the circumference of that circle along the whole path uniformly. But if we edit this 3D component and we go into this, uh, into this subdivision object, we have a lot more granular control of the shape of that object. So yes, if you're looking for just a simple representation, extrude long path is one way to get this kind of effect. Um, but what I would argue is in this circumstance, we actually have more control um, over this over this object. So like if we wanted to change uh, some of the, the geometry with the subdivision tool, uh, for example, uh, add like a hump or, you know, this is kind of on the fly, but we could be much more granular with our control there. You can see here that we have a lot more ability to control that 3D object. Cool. Cool. So um, as you can see, this is a, a good way to just cut some steps out of the process if you're going for a, you know, an ambitious uh, 3D model. Um, we aren't diving too deep into it because obviously in, you know, the 45 minutes of real time that we have, uh, we can only get so far. 
Um, but I would encourage you to use some of these methods in your workflow, even if you're not doing uh, something as ambitious as this kind of organic flowing form like we've started with here, and we look forward to continuing on a future episode. Um, but if you use the some of the skills that you might have picked up through organizing repetitive objects with the resource manager, um, that allows you to save a lot of time in your workflow because if you need to edit any objects, uh, for example, if we actually just wanted to take um, one of these objects here, uh, go back to my selection tool, if I wanted to take this object, just one of them, and change the fill color, uh, we can do that. Uh, okay, well, I gotta go into the symbol, obviously. So edit the 3D component of the symbol. If I want to change the color of that uh, or the shape, like I demonstrated earlier, we can do that on the fly. So imagine if you had these objects kind of um, different instances of these objects or symbol definitions throughout your drawing area or throughout your model, uh, then you just changed the, the attributes of all of those instances because you edited that one symbol. Do we have any other questions? None so far. Okay. Well, Barbara, again, I do appreciate y'all making some time to uh, explore these uh, uh, modeling capabilities of Vectorworks Spotlight. Obviously, like I said, we can dive a lot deeper. So uh, maybe we can schedule that next follow-up webinar and go even further. It would be really awesome if we could uh, use subdivision modeling to model the dragon head, apply some textures to this, maybe even uh, put some lights on it and make it more of an experience for the clients. So very much looking forward to it, Jacob. <laughs> so very much. Thank you so much for today's presentation. I think we've had great feedback throughout. Thanks, everybody, for attending. I'm going to switch over to my slides to bid everybody goodbye. I want to remind you that I've recorded the webinar and it will be posted on YouTube and Vimeo. And this is our product page for Vector Spotlight 2019. And this is the page for Tangibly products. Um, there, uh, there are currently a couple of trainings. I uh, welcome you all to explore them and check them out because um, they're really, there's a lot of value in what Jacob and his team offers. And thanks again for attending. We can, you can find us all over uh, the social media universe. And uh, um, Again, watch us again on Vimeo YouTube. Thanks again, Jacob. Uh, Dragon's Head coming up uh, <laughs> on our next webinar. Have a great day, and everybody. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you again for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.